Hi everybody. Let's get started on this sighting and proportion drawing. I've already gridded out my subject and my large paper and I have two copies of my subject gridded out. Uh, hopefully you're able to find something where you can see your drawing board easily and you can see your source material easily. Uh, the closer you can get your source to your drawing, uh, the, the better. Um, if I was working on uh, from a tablet, for example, I might even want to have some kind of uh, tablet holder that would let me get my uh, tablet um, close to my artwork. The closer I can get it and the more square and also parallel to the surface that, that you're on, the, the more accurate and quicker um, easy, uh, translation, easier it's going to be for you. So uh, again, I was talking about the margin, and one of the first things I do is I just kind of hand draw in, and I look at some clues here. I say, well, where does that margin overlap the grid? And I'm lightly sketching it in. It may not even be showing up on camera, which is good. I don't want to deeply embed this in here. This is just an early on construction line that says, hey, when you are in in um, measuring the proportions the, of the objects themselves that are going in your frame. Okay, if you forget to do this very important step of outlining your margin, everything that you draw in your drawing is going to be off. Um, I guess I'm glad that I get to put this on video because I have to repeat this a lot in the in the classroom, but you, you can't forget to leave a little bit of space here uh, for your margin if you've been following along with how I've created this, this photograph off. So skip a little place. Again, I think about it, it's a little bit like a, um, a simple machine. This margin, this grid, those things are going to work for you um, <clears throat> even if there's a it's drawn by hand and there's a little bit of uh, wobble to it or a little bit of some imperfection. This grid, this this margin thing uh, will will work um, with some some practice and um, just trial and error. And I want to start by trying to set them down onto the ground plane. The 2B pencil. So I'm kind of taking a guess at where the footprints are for the these shapes, these forms, and I have some clues. I what I'm doing is I'm just I can scale upward. I, I you can estimate what, how big the shape should be on your large paper. You're making an enlargement. Okay, you have to scale the forms upward, but you can start to see that there is a a in intervals and the, the shapes and sizes um, are growing at a predictable way. You know they're scaling, uh, they're scaling up proportionally as well. So you, your brain somehow I don't know exactly how the science of it all, but you're able to adapt. And I found uh, lots of people are able to scale things up pretty readily with this method. So uh, here, what I'm doing, I talked about this briefly in lectures, I'm just trying to use more like right angles to kind of help me establish a box or a rectangle uh, a f on the surface of the paper that, that is going to help me identify, well, where's the top of the picture? Where's the bottom of the picture? So go ahead and put these measuring lines in there these bounding box lines. These lines, you know, and you can even, what you can start to do is you you may even, if you were drawing things from life as opposed to having a nice grid on your photo, what you would start to do is send out grid lines based on the objects themselves. So these lines here, I'm going to suggest you should do it even with your photo because these measuring lines, these long lines, help you arrange your picture. They help you make decisions about if the logic between one thing in the picture is if the tip of the picture is the right height 
compared to the height of the egg, for example. So these long lines, you can project points or incidents from one form. You can project something that you know all the way across the paper. And it could help you, the, the footprint of this picture could help you figure out something that was happening all the way across the uh, on other side of the page. So talk, that's what I mean by when I say measuring lines is these long lines that are helping you arrange and helping you make comparisons not just about your one your one guy or your one object but about all of them that are you trying to draw them together um, as a grouping and uh, that's also part of the assignment uh, definitely embedded in this I um, part of the grading I want the the, the, the arrangement of these things to stay basically exactly the same as you see them in your photo. That means that the airspace, the negative space, or what I sometimes call the, uh, the airspace, or the air around the objects, the negative space, the shapes around the objects, and the space between the objects should also be accurate. So you're not just copying the proportions of the objects themselves, but you also want to, in this assignment, pick a photograph that has good space between the objects too. So that's just one of those things that artists have to, have to um, deal with is, is that the shapes around objects are as important sometimes as the object in the in the piece. So start with a couple of things that are close to you. Establish their footprint. Put a midline that comes up out of that footprint. Find the top of the object so that we're kind of honing in on some of the key components here that I would need to sketch this in at the right size and the right shape and in the right place. So one thing that's happening for me is that my grid is getting very faint compared to what I've drawn. So that's okay, but what I need to do is don't lose it. Come back, redraw. I just What I did is I drew by hand uh, the intersections and a couple of segments here. And it usually is just, of course, it's the stuff right here in the middle. It's a little bit like a you know, board game strategy or something. You know, if you know where the intersections are, you know a lot about how, how to measure and how, how to arrange and um, how to make the smaller decisions that are um, what makes um, the drawing um, more convincing or less convincing. So here's my grid line, and here's my intersection, and here's the top of my base. So I, I think I got it in kind of the wrong spot. Uh, to to get started so that that happens you know so I need to I need to reconsider just a little bit but the way that I'm making decisions about hey did I get it a, a, a half inch off or a quarter inch off in one direction or the other that that's the relating to it back to something that is known and what's known and, and stable and constant is that is that grid. So it's a bit like navigating um, something. You can the angles that you can observe are going to be the angles that you you're going to draw. The sizes and shapes of objects will essentially scale up proportionally. Sometimes it's helpful too when you're seated here in a chair like this is to try drawing with your pencil this way, um, underhanded. Um, it's going to give you just a, maybe a little bit, a little bit more uh, gesture because it's connecting the pencil uh, to your arm um, in in a slightly different way. It's taking me a while to to kind of nudge some of these initial forms. Um, around and I want you to think about pencil um, as being kind of 
uh, plastic or malleable. Here's my diagonal measuring line. Early on, as I'm building something, these measuring lines are, are some of the most important things in my drawing. Now, after I get a few more clues about getting it right, I can wipe them away. But I don't want to get rid of those measuring lines, even these diagonals, um, until I'm until I'm more, much more confident about did I size and get the size and shape of my objects um, to be closer to uh, what I am trying to describe. This happens all the time. You start with an ellipse or a footprint and you have to move it over. It started all the way over here and I wound up you know, moving it over and, small, and making it smaller um, as I worked. You have to have a very flexible uh, sense to uh, a kind of flexible approach to these things. If you try to put the details on something too early, um, you inevitably are going to get them the wrong size and shape for the rest of the picture. It's just one of the biggest problems um, beginners have is not not observing the details about one vase. Because um, a lot of people are pretty good at capturing a lot of elements easily, but it's also what's hard is pulling it all together into a finished design um, and having the, all the, the shapes and all the pieces and all the spaces start to make, make more sense. So I'm not going to color this in or anything like that right now. I just want to kind of treat it as a gesture. It's just sort of a, a line drawing and if you get a little closer to this drawing you would see there's lots of, lots of lines basically. It's, it's kind of um, loose and open, and I'm not trying to make one line do all the work. Okay? It's just I'm taking little, little strokes at things and uh, starting to bring things together. Now, I'm, you're probably going to see some cast shadows right away, which is a good thing if you're seeing that stuff, and you should just outline those shadow shapes, okay? but don't, don't fill them in. I don't want you to start to color in on this, and this is not, I didn't invent this, this philosophy's been around for centuries. Drawing's been around for centuries, obviously. <clears throat> um, but it, if you color in, if you shade things in before your, your proportions are structured, you're going to have to redo it. You're going to have to, you're going to make a mess. Workflow goes better if you can resolve issues with your lines first and shade later. Okay. And I don't want to get started on shading this thing or masking this thing now because then it gets more mature, it gets older, it gets further along than everything else and that's still a huge big piece of blank paper. So again, a lot of, a lot of people get really uh, fixated on single things and they forget about the big picture. And I don't want you to do that, I want you to develop work habits that let you um, uh, let something that's not quite finished be a stand-in for um, what it needs to be later on. Um, you need to say, hey, it's not quite done, but I, I got to move along to, to get in order to catch all the other stuff up to this level that is basically, well, it's pretty good, but it's not quite done. But what I feel like it's got quite a bit of proportional accuracy, it's relating uh, pretty well to the grid and to the object itself. It, you know, maybe I could say maybe it looks a little wide here. I could probably I probably need to keep changing it its proportion, but I've gotten I would say you know I'll estimate I've gotten its proportion maybe you know 90 percent or so, which is a heck of a lot better than zero percent. So you know you achieve whatever that is 70 percent accuracy and you should move along. 
Okay, another trick here that I'm using, I build it with this midline and this footprint so it's got transparency and then I want to use a symmetrical shape. A little bit like, um, oh, there's lots of symmetrical forms like uh, uh, hearts or clubs, you know, the symbols on, on playing cards. You balance those things across an accent and you can start to create uh, more complicated shapes that are still symmetric and balanced. So look for that midline. A lot of these objects are symmetric across a form. Now when you have a pitcher or a coffee cup or something that has a handle, so what we're talking about is not just an object that doesn't just have pure symmetry but it has bilateral symmetry. In, in order to depict that correctly, you need a midline, a midline, which is different than this perspective center. Slightly different. So that's one reason that I draw these lines right here on these um, objects before I photograph them, is so that you know where that line of bilateral symmetry actually is in your drawing. And so anything that has bilateral symmetry, you need to understand that it has a midline. Um, and that midline is being uh, kind of uh, governed by the rules of perspective. build these forms transparently. I have these uh, structure lines drawn on our subject matter so that you can actually put an ellipse. It helps you free up yourself to actually put an ellipse there as you're building the segments of this form. I'm kind of chunking this thing out into segments and when you parse the information down into smaller packets a lot of times you can um, assess it, you can analyze it better. If you make each task that you have to um, complete a little smaller, maybe, there, maybe you have to do a lot more tasks, but you make each individual task a little, a little smaller and a little more focused then what happens is the totality or the summation of those little decisions or those little tasks um, starts to take on a kind of uh, believable accuracy. So we think about these measuring lines, these bounding boxes, Drawing things transparently, the marks of the, the grid line, all that stuff is like little clues, little points that I can measure between, and then eventually I get enough information that I can build a curve. It takes a while, that's kind of what I'm trying to convey. And part of my training too, I think, I don't know if it's apparent, but um, one thing that I'm doing as I'm building curves oftentimes is I'm breaking those curves down into segments. That means I'm oftentimes, even though the object might start to look curved, it starts out very angular or for me in my, in my thinking about it. So and what happens is pencil and charcoal and other drawing material is just very flexible and very malleable. And something can start off very angular, and then you can go back and you can add transitions. And you can continue to refine those angles and adding, you know, new angles and new transitions. And ultimately you can hone in on where that, that line ought to be for a curve. Uh, sometimes I think it's beneficial. You can flip your drawing upside down. It helps you maybe see things a little bit differently. But... Another reason, main reason, I actually like to pull, turn my drawing upside down is so that I can reach things that maybe seem a little bit uncomfortable from another angle. Um, a note about moving your drawing. Um, it's 
it's okay to move your drawing if your um, subject matter is is clipped perfectly square to to your artwork. That's another reason that's very beneficial to actually print these things out as opposed to looking at them on your screen. Is that it, it's easy to flip. You can flip things on your screen too, but there's more steps, which can interrupt your flow um, when you're trying to be creative. So, okay, I'm over here. I want to build this handle. I've got the margin. I've got my grid line. So I'm actually putting little kind of uh, notes or tick marks at some of those key places where stuff cr I have intersections um, or measuring points that I can readily see. And I want to try to place this handle in. So here's my margin. And why I, why I want that margin is that it helps me the the negative space here outside of the handle is helping me draw it in the right size and shape and angle for the rest of the piece. So look at the shapes of the spaces around the object. The airspace is as important as the shape itself. One again, one problem beginners have is uh, you know, being able to possibly draw one or two things very well, but being able to relate multiple complex forms on the same piece of paper and put them into space convincingly is a, is a bigger challenge to, to achieve. I have a, a couple of planes here that are overlapping, so I need another piece here. When it comes to representing handles and uh, lips, ellipses, uh, tops of vases and things like that, oftentimes um, it's a, just a kind of core philosophy of mine. You need more than one line. So I think I mentioned something similar, but you don't want to try to make one line do too much work. If I look at this handle and I see a shape here at the edge, that means it's a plane change. There, there's a change of direction on the object itself. So I, I have to, this is what I call in the classroom, adding more parts. So I, I have the outline of an object then I have to use my eraser um, and go back and add smaller shapes or what we call contour lines on the inside of those of those shapes to add more parts. So adding more parts is what I call it. But uh, you, some people might think about it as adding details. Um, but what I'm talking about is being able to go inside and I'll keep doing this um, as I work. Um, but adding more parts is, is one way that you can, again, bring um, a lot more structure and definition to, um, to the things that you're drawing. And the trick here is that a lot of people are maybe pretty good, actually, at adding more parts or drawing details. It's getting it the right size and shape so that when you do spend the time to focus on it, you get it in the right place you know, on your paper so that you don't have to redo it um, or, you, or it doesn't mess up also uh, doesn't mess up what happens on the rest of the page because if I drew something over here that's too big or too small it's ultimately going to have repercussions all the way um, across my sheet
I have a shadow here and um, an underplane or a line separation and then there's a cast shadow that I need to uh, try to fit under here with the cast shadow shape. Talked about this in one of the subsequent videos but cast shadows in this class I just want you to outline them. You see a cast shadow or drop shadow underneath of that object you um, should put a line around it, basically the same line that you're using to draw everything else. You want to just go ahead and outline your shadows, your lines of separation, and use a very similar kind of pressure and edge that you're using for your real forms. Now the main reason that I talk about this, or ask you to do this, is that there's a lot of history involved here. I mean, artists have been doing this for a while, but it's just been noticed or found that uh, cast shadows tend to be one of the sharpest edges in, in the whole image. One of the sharpest edges in the whole image. So what that's really saying is that, you know, for um, eons, for millennia, or whatever, you know, you're your brains um, are being trained to look for sharp edges so we're, we're really keyed in on on looking for those, those shadows because they help us you know see movement and see things in the natural world okay once once you have a few things drawn you can uh, can continue on I like to start by looking for an ellipse here, a footprint of something, and I use the grid to help me figure out how wide that ellipse should be. It's a little bit like um, some, some kind of uh, body movement skill. You have to just go for it. It's gonna, they're not going to be perfect at first. There's a kind of a gesture that comes from your, your shoulder and the way you hold your pencil and everybody's got to practice these things for themselves, but um, the ellipse, you have to think about it as being something that's kind of, at first, it's very flexible and it, 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 you're not trying to get it perfect. It's got to have a little bit of life to it so that you can move it around and not get too attached to it. You're willing to make changes and um, kind of nudge those shapes around. You're too attached to a single edge or a single curve um, or a single line um, when you're drawing um, in this in this way. You're you're going to be moving too slowly, and um, you're going to be missing out on a lot of the other phases um, that you are being asked to, to go through. So, um, what does that mean? Well, it means that I I'm trying to help you. Uh, come up with uh, work methods, working methods that let you uh, pace yourself as you draw. And uh, what, what that often means is distributing your work across the surface. And not, not getting too attached to some of the initial things that are happening, but rem remembering that Part of your objective here is to complete the whole picture, to do something that becomes a finished piece. Other metaphors I have for this uh, approach is it's a little bit like clay or pottery or something where you, you know, the material you have is you can put it out there and you can smooth it around and you can take it off or you can add to it. Um, and it just kind of, it kind of grows and becomes closer and closer to what you're you're envisioning at, as you are developing your surface. Um, and you can move your drawing board around. Um, I think it's beneficial not to tilt things too much, but to go um, in horizontals and verticals as you're moving your work as well. The benefit of sitting at a table with the drawing board is it just lets you have a little bit more flexibility sometimes with than a, a, a drawing table. Draw transparently, just sketch right in, right through those things. Using the grid to kind of help me get the confidence about where to start. Taking some swipes at it, basically. My strategy here is to 
draw the things that are sitting down on the ground first. It just makes more sense to me, uh, logically, that you would put things down underneath first. And then if you have uh, subsequent layers, like things on top of this uh, cylinder, that you could stack it on top of the cylinder once the cylinder was finished. And it's, it's the shape of the grid, sometimes plus the negative space, that also is going to give you the clues about where and how to draw. Here, I'm, what I'm looking for, there's a little bit of negative space. And I'm just looking, for, I'm actually looking for the negative space as, as one of my indicators that um, it's okay for me to proceed. And um, the reason is that I feel like something's a little off. Okay, I haven't quite un uncovered it yet, but I'm still searching for... Um, something that's going to help me figure out where and how to size the, this ellipse correctly. So I'm looking at some of the, the spaces and the shapes and the other objects that are directly around it um, so that I can be a little more confident about pushing in harder on uh, some of the, the shapes and edges that I want to save. So I want to get the top of that cylinder drawn fairly fairly correctly so that I can relate this lantern onto the top of the box. What I'm doing here is sketching the footprint of the lantern as it would be nested or sitting on top of this um, cylinder. The things that help me size and shape things correctly are this idea of establishing a bounding box. Set up an area that encloses the object that you're trying to draw. So that you know how big, how tall, how wide it's supposed to be even before you try to fill in some of these uh, smaller details. Remember from one of the other videos that I, I gesture things in in kind of a loose, sketchy way, and then I'll use my eraser quite a bit to come back. Sometimes even erasing off almost all of um, the object itself. Uh, I don't know. I just I have to get started somewhere. I like to give myself permission to dive in and use a lot, you know, as many lines as I need to to start to develop the presence, the energy of objects. If I'm being too careful or too slow uh, right from the start, the, the drawing drags along, it doesn't have enough energy, um, and you, you know, you might not even uh, really get finished. So distribute your work. It still takes a long time, you know, just to kind of block these things in, in this gestural way. I move to the, the next piece and that just sometimes it's, it's hard. I think one of the things about learning to be creative and to uh, do artwork is it's just sometimes hard to know what to do next or when to move forward in, in, in the process that you're using. And use transparency thinking even to, you know, sort of figure out parts of this big round hat, about hat box behind there um, even though I can't, I can't see those pieces. So uh, let's see. Th this kind of thing it's is fun for me um, because I like that it's loose and open-ended in the in terms of how I can approach um, it. But there's also uh, criteria to meet and uh, goals to attain in terms of 
uh, capturing the scene and uh, drawing things so that they become um, more um, accurate proportionally and also start to take on some dimensionality. These uh, two bottles up here are challenging uh, to draw because they have slight irregularities in their form. Um, they're not uh, perfectly round bottles. They both have square and angular sides on them. Um, and I, it's one of those things that it, the, in, in the classroom you can walk up, you can observe uh, A little bit of trial and error, you hopefully can establish the footprints of those objects. That gives me a lot more confidence about uh, drawing them proportionally and about also capturing the way that they're sitting and the way that they are um, coming down across the back edge of the object they're sitting on. So this being able to visualize this kind of thinking um, helps me draw things that seem more plausible. One thing I'm doing a lot is redrawing this grid as many times as you need to. I don't really count off for having some parts of your grid in, in this assignment. One of the things that I'm looking at here is the negative shape. Um, a very strong clue here for me besides beyond just the grid and the object itself, but it's the spaces around it and how the, these pieces look, if they look, the space around the object looks correct, then you have a good chance that the object itself is getting closer to being what it needs to be. If you just look at one photograph that you, you don't have a lot of connection to, um, things can look kind of flat. It can be hard to understand the structures. It would be great if you could be there in the classroom and you can see these things, um, but when you can't, um, what you might think about doing is using that web gallery to um, look, look at some of the other uh, pictures from the photo set. This object has bilateral symmetry. It's a little bit tricky. Some of the proportions and angles are uh, not as easy to capture as you might think. But I want to talk about how to build the handle on this form. One thing you can do after you have sort of the outlines uh, con constructed and you feel like the overall proportion is good take your eraser and uh, wipe out some of the information on in the middle and you know clean up some of the outer edges of the form as needed so that the silhouette, the outline, the shape of the object seems clear, seems in focus, seems um, pretty close to what it ought to be. Look at the midline here. I can use the midline to help me figure out where the handle is going to be placed. So if here is an outline or the silhouette of this object, I can kind of assess where I think the midline is drawn in on the photograph and start to sketch that map line or that midline up. So here we have what's called a midline shift. So when the object is pushing in or out in space and you're trying to track a midline, and you, you're going to have to shift that midline as the object changes its size or shape. So you might just take a little bit of flexible thinking to be able to understand that. But that's called a midline shift. It happens all the time. 
you know, this this piece has a midline shift in it. So just just be aware that midlines can, you know, you they can move around a little bit as you're tracking them around the form. There's the other line on this side of the picture. So these lines are are drawn on this object so that it it's dividing it up at the midline and also at the right down the side. And the reason is that that's letting you see how those lines are actually behaving in reality. So that you can draw them in your drawing, but then you can also take it a little bit further and you could start to invent these kinds of lines. And that actually is part of this assignment, is that we're going to draw these surface lines, we want to leave them on there. And uh, your job as an artist is to help, is to come up with um, a creative way to draw these sort of imaginary lines on the surfaces of these objects, but still have the drawing itself, you know, look, look aesthetic aesthetically pleasing and interesting when it's done. Because too many lines um, for mapping going to look a little bit chaotic and busy. Uh, not enough going to look a little bit blank. I'm honing in on a completion for my design. After I get the proportions for the main parts of this object and I have the surface mapping established, I can start to add more parts or add more detail shapes like the handle and the ridges up here on top of this object. So let's start with the handle. The first thing I want to do here is I can use my eraser as needed, but I'm going to uh, put a, a footprint or a shape here which is kind of like an ellipse to me. This ellipse shows where the handle is attaching to the body of the object. And it's going to allow me to make some decisions about how to draw the rest of the piece so that it convincingly attached to the surface of the form. So I'm going to start here with the outline of the outer edge of the handle. I'm just looking for clues or edges that can help me attach the handle down onto the surface of the form. Use your eraser to clean up construction lines and lines you don't need. I can also notice now that there's a midline, the continuation of this midline. I can track that up and around and I see some of it echoed here on the handle itself. So again, I can complete some of the logic of my picture using the surface mapping type thinking to help me bring a little more structure, a little more plausibility in here, there's also a plane change here. Sometimes those small shapes, those detailed parts, uh, are a lot more complex and require more lines than you might previously have thought. And the only way that I can get there is by moving in this direction, kind of move from the big shapes, get those in the right size and the right shape, and then start to use um, things that are very logical and measurable and um, to capture uh, some the placement of some of the smaller parts on the form. You can use your eraser to clean up shapes as you go. And then when you erase, what happens is you can still see a little bit of what's there. And I don't count off. I like the record, that history, and those ghost lines, those lines that are left over after I erase. Um, actually, sometimes I use them, I pick them up, I can trace over them. Other times they just, I, they, they're just there. And you just have to use it as part of uh, the way that it looks when you draw by hand. So anyway, um, I oftentimes will erase things off as a way to get started on adding more parts, adding more shapes. I want to draw the, the lip of, of this um, bottle here. So again, the key here is that you, you might have a good chance of seeing it, um, but the, the hard part is getting it to be the right size and the right shape too for the rest of the piece. 
my strategy when here when I'm here adding more parts is that oftentimes two lines or three lines even are better than one line. So here's the ellipse. That's going to be the outer ellipse for the top edge of uh, that form. And what I want to do is insert a new ellipse onto the inside of that so that I have a concentric ring. My trick for doing that is I just put four little dots here in, on the top of this ellipse so that I can kind of guide my hand and insert a new skinny little shape up there that is an ellipse and it's following that progression of ellipses uh, from the perspective handout. So I'm just, when you have to add more parts, you have to uh, get things the right size, you have to erase, and then you kind of come back and, and keep adding more shapes to what you've drawn. So it's different than just erasing it and making it darker. Um, I also am erasing it and redrawing things as I work to add more as I go. Another structure right here. And another one right here. If I was too quick to draw all those details and all those structures on top of this milk bottle, I would inevitably get all that stuff in the wrong spot, the wrong size, the wrong shape. So I have to start with all these clues to get it scaled down in the right place so that I can have confidence to add um, details and pieces uh, with that much uh, clarity and pressure on my point. So yeah, once I'm there, I'm actually pressing uh, pretty hard uh, once I know where stuff's going. That's what's causing that line weight to get bold and to sharpen up too, is that um, once I know kind of where those shapes are at and I can close them up, I, I'm going to go in for it, you know, I'm, and really press on. I'm kind of tempted also to grab uh, my mechanical pencil here just to tune up uh, this little tiny in, inner ellipse. Well, the reason I don't want to draw the whole drawing with the mechanical pencil is it's just too, a little too small of a tool for me. I, I get impatient and I can't get the um, range, you know, dynamic range that I want with just, just a mechanical pencil. But it's a great tool. You to come back and insert or uh, this little skinny ellipse or for doing uh, some of these small parts. And my main uh, philosophy here is you got to have these small parts um, and that when you're drawing them that oftentimes two or three lines are going to be there instead of just one uh, big thick line. So teach yourself to uh, look for the small shapes, the skinny pieces, and you do that by not just using one big thick line but by making small shapes uh, with multiple lines. I'm honing in on the completion of my silhouette. Silhouette is the totality or the outline of, of all of the objects. It's what completes the piece. It's a graphic edge or shape and it's one of those things that people who know about drawing and know about art are looking for some kind of clear, clean shape that's going to carry you all the way from one side of the piece up and over and back down uh, to the other side. So we're trying, one of the games we're doing here is creatives as artists is trying to get people to follow us here you know and just gonna uh, the simplest thing here you know we'll start at this edge and get someone over here well we've got a gap here so I got a couple options here with this gap and I could continue to draw what's here piecing in other shapes but sometimes those other shapes might be too busy or I might have enough here with 
capturing my main subject that I don't really want to add more because it it's distracting. Anyway, uh, students always say, well, how many? I think between five and eight main subject pieces is enough. And what I always say is that you can edit, you can get rid of some of these background pieces, especially if you understand what page division is and what a silhouette is, and um, you um, make an effort to complete the page division at this point. This is one of the main things that makes your drawing seem finished or complete is that you are aware of this concept, this silhouette, <clears throat> this page division idea. So what I'm trying to do is create a bridge or a link that takes me all the way from one side of the paper to the other. Super important, this top edge of these objects. What you should be able to do is basically trace around those edges quickly, easily, and it should kind of almost be fun and enjoyable, and you should be able to cut this pathway up over the top of that thing um, with confidence. So I have some gaps here and here, and so what the artist needs to do to establish page division is fill in those gaps and link the edges of the sheet to the main subject in the center of the page. Until you've done that, you have not established page division. So I can have an object coming off, off the side here. That's all good. So what I'm going to do here is take out some of the stuff in the background. And I have to imagine what would the edge of my table look like. Well, we can change page division pretty radically about the edges of the table. Sometimes you might want to keep what's there. I do like this sort of angular um, bit of table here. And so I'm trying to figure out, well, where would the table be back there? And I think it probably ought to be about right there. So instead of having this grouping of objects back there, what I've decided to do is come up with a line that's going to be like a stand-in edge. You can make these things up. You have um, quite a bit of uh, flexibility as an artist to move the table edge around in your design to create page division uh, that, that seems interesting and also makes sense, that the, the space looks uh, logical, looks deep. So what that what that's what these lines are that this is representing is the back of of my table, back of my table, and when I complete those segments back there where the table is visible, what I've done is I've created a physical link between the left and the right side of my page, and it's going to then also allow me to now see this background, or what we're calling space tone. I can now see that whole space tone also as a big, whole, complete shape. So I've, what I'm doing is I'm trying to pop out my silhouette. But inadvertently what I'm doing is I'm finishing the table and I'm also bringing a very cohesive silhouette or negative space um, to the whole background as well. This is one of the main things I'm looking for in a finished piece, um, a finished still life, is a page division, uh, space tone, a strong silhouette. Now look, this is, this is what is my indicator and this is what I would be doing for students in class as I walk around the room and I sit there at your easel for a minute and I say, can I do this? What I do is this. I say, can I move my pencil from one edge of the paper quickly and freely and easily all the way across the top edge of all these objects without any hang-ups? And if I can trace around all those objects with confidence and there's no little gaps or missing pieces of information, then I know that I have, or the student has, achieved the, a strong silhouette and strong page division. Other notes about negative space, I'm reminded here by looking at this. 
you can create stronger negative spaces by closing up your shapes. By closing up your shapes. So where the negative space or where the air space is in and around your object, you need to close up or really try to define the edges, not of the shape itself actually, but what I'm doing is a very strange paradoxical thing, but I'm defining the negative space. Not defining the objects, but rather defining the air space around them. Um, making that air space, uh, negative spaces, um, even a little more obvious and clear. I've already started to work out some shadow systems, but that would be the end um, of the line art phase. You could, you could get a lot of credit just for turning in something like this. But in terms of uh, getting uh, passing college credit for the assignment, you need to have a strong silhouette and page division. You need to have all your objects drawn. And you also need to start to have your cast shadows down here. Um, and when you, one of the things that I look for in the classroom is uh, having cast shadows on everything. So the next step is to come back and add small parts and cast shadows to all of the pieces in the drawing. When I don't see a really strong cast shadow, what I recommend you do is double up the front edge of the object. What that's doing is it's saying, hey, um, there's a little skinny bit of shadow sitting underneath of that object and then sometimes that shadow kind of trails off and becomes much more apparent as a kind of cast shadow or drop shadow. But again, I, uh, some, in class I call it lying. It's kind of a funny joke. But what I'm really saying is, hey, um, don't try to make one line and do what two lines need to do. Um, you might, as a beginner, see only one line here at the front of this. But what it really needs is two skinny little parallel lines to create a long skinny shadow shape underneath there. And then out here I see that shadow as being a, a little more obvious. So again, when you look at something, it's in full light. You don't really see the, the, the cast shadow um, as a, a big piece. What you should do is you double up that line and when you draw these objects with two lines at the front here, what you're saying is, hey, there's the sit core and the rim core you are building in the ability for yourself to come back and develop the light and shadow on these objects um, with even more kind of convincing um, uh, look at, in the end. So again, what, I'm, what I got here would, would definitely be enough to earn um, some passing credit uh, for, for this, this project. Um, it's still a little bit loose, it's a little bit gestural, but I feel like the proportions are very accurate um, and the light and shadow has uh, been projected on here. I, as I can see, my cast shadows, and I, I'm still proving a few cast shadows. There's What I want to do is keep working through, but anyway, my point here, I haven't gone to any of the later, more advanced layers yet, um, which you would want to do if you're seeking um, something beyond just um, a baseline passing. So again, what I'm kind of saying is, um, you know, the A and B artwork is is going to go maybe a little further than this, but um, definitely you you can make it through um, this course with something that is kind of looking like this. So get started on this. Get those initial uploads in. I'm excited to see what everybody's working on.